Okay, in 5.1, what happens when we accumulate instantaneous changes over an interval? In other words, the area under a curve. This is called integral calculus. Some of you have been in physics and have talked about integrals and know what I'm talking about. Those of you who haven't, it's still not that bad. So our goals in this particular section is to understand distance traveled, use rectangular approximation method. The author calls it RAM, rectangular approximation method. And we have to go with it because that's the way the book is written. And then we'll talk about how would you find the volume of a sphere. We are not going to do the cardiac output, so I'm going to cross that one out. And all we're going to do is this one today. A little bit, a little bit with the second one. So, and it's, it's all geometry, actually. Consider a train traveling at a constant rate of 75 miles per hour for three hours. What is the total distance traveled? Well, I am going to draw a picture of that. So here's my time, here's my rate, and this is 75 miles per hour, one, two, three hours. So you're going at a constant rate for three hours. I know it's not the greatest picture. How far have you gone? Carolyn, what do I have to do with this? 75 miles per hour, you can do it dimensionally, and then you have three hours. I should have put my units in there because they may ask for units. And what do you do with those? Multiply. So you get 75 times three miles. Now, if this were free response, I wouldn't multiply it out. I would just leave it. Did you get all the handouts? Okay. What does this represent? This is the height of my rectangle. This is the base. So the distance traveled, because we know from you know, ninth grade physical science, is rate times time. The distance traveled is the area under the curve. You guys seen that before? That's all it is. Distance equals rate times time from physics. Are you okay with that? you see okay, Cole? Okay, so the distance, and when you hear the word total, that's a clue this is what you're going to do. Because you know what you're going to do on the exam? You're either going to take a derivative or you're going to find an integral. <laughs> that's it. So when they say, find the total distance traveled, you're going to say, oh, I'm going to find an integral. How do you see equal to the area under the curve? Is that okay? Now that was easy because that was a constant rate. And we all travel, so we already all know that. But what if we don't have a constant rate? What if we have V of T, my rate is T squared. What does that look like? T squared looks like a parabola, right? Oh, I don't know if I can get this going. Well, so it's the parabola, and I want to find, it says, the particle starts at x equals 0. That's important to know, because you don't always start at the origin. If I want to find how far it is from my house, and I live in the mound, and I want to go to Minneapolis, and here's Minnetonka, MHS, but how far is it from mound to Minneapolis? I want to find that total distance. But I start here. I am about 14 miles from home. So my starting position is 14 miles from the origin. Does that make some sense? So that's going to be critical on the exam. They're never going to start at zero. You're going to have to add in that starting position. So your final position is equal to your starting plus the distance you travel. And there are some good things about this book, and that's one of them where they, he gives you practice with it. So this particle is going to start at zero, so that makes it easy. And it says, where is the particle at t equals 3? Well, you start at zero plus 
the distance traveled. And you find the distance traveled, it's the area under the curve. And on the homework, for the first day, it's just a matter of finding areas under curves. That's all it is. So let's see. I'm going to put this as 3. And it says, use three rectangles of equal width. So what I do is divide the base up as equally as I can. <laughs> and then I draw in the vertical lines. And I don't see any rectangles, do you? <laughs> no. We can put rectangles in really three ways. You can have the rectangle hit on the right side of the rectangle, hits the function there, like this. Would that be an overestimate or underestimate of the actual area? Over. Okay, that's called the right ram. One more. Or you could have it go under, so it would be like this. It's hitting on the left side of my rectangle. It's called the L ram. And this one's going to have how many? Zero. So that's an underestimate. Or you could put trapezoids in, which we will. You could use the midpoint. So to find the height of this rectangle, I'll find halfway between 2 and 3. Where is halfway between 2 and 3? Okay, so 5 halves. And that's the height of my rectangle. So some of it's going to be outside the curve, and some of it's going to be inside. And what's nice about the midpoint, it's called the midpoint rule, is that this is the most accurate one. If you look at it, the, these, the outside error and the inside error, it's pretty much going to cancel out. Does that make sense? So where's the next midpoint? Halfway between 1 and 2 is 1 and a half or 3 halves. You'll see why I want to do 3 halves. Now what you have to do on the homework, because it looks just like the homework, is you're going to have to keep things organized. And then this is, halfway between 0 and 1 is 1 half. And so it's not going to be a very tall rectangle, but it's better than 0. And that's all we have to do. And you could use the right or left, but that's what it said to do. So how do I find the area? How do you find the area of a rectangle? Base times height. The base, this is the base. That's the change in the x values. What's the height? That's not quite the change in y. It's the y coordinate, though. You're right, you could think of it that way. But it's f of x. So the y coordinate gives you the height. So when we start looking at integrals, I hope to recognize that as, a, as actually as area. So what's the area of the first rectangle? The area is equal to the base, which is 1, times the height at 1 half. Now I'm just going to, well, let's use v, because it is v. It's v of 1 half. Plus, how big is this base? 1 times v of one and a half. I'm going to do three halves. You'll see why in a second. Plus one times five halves. F of five halves. Excuse me. It's V of five halves. There's my plan. Do you see how it's kind of organized? And even more so, if this were into one, I could factor it out. I mean, I'm going to factor it out anyway. So it's V of one half plus V of three halves. You see some patterns there? Plus V of 5 halves, if you wanted to go further, you'd be have next one be V of 7 halves, right? If we wanted to go to 4 or something like that. And then all we have to do is figure these out. So remember, V of T is equal to T squared. So the area is equal to 1 times, and it's 1 half squared plus 3 halves squared. You see why I wanted to have improper fractions? I didn't want to square 1 and a half. Here, I'll slide it up plus 5 halves squared. If this is free response, do you need to go further? No. Don't. Because if you mess it up, you're going to get it wrong. That's good enough. I know, isn't that amazing? That's good enough. It's going to be hard for you to stop. But this is, well, we, we want to know how big it is, so I'll show you something with the calculator. This is 1 fourth plus 9 fourths plus 25 fourths. Don't forget to square both the numerator and denominator. And if I add that all up, 1 and 9 gives me 10. 10 and 25 gives me 35. 
fourth. I would like to know how big that is. It's eight, what? Eight and three quarters, 8.75. You guys know how to do that, right? Because if it's multiple choice, you have to be able to go to that decimal. So what is it exactly? Now, bring your calculator. i got to figure out how to put programs on here. I haven't, I did it once, but not recently. Now, mine's all set up, so I'll have to go a little slow. We will see this again. This is the type of problem they put on the calculator part of the exam, actually. Because sometimes to do these areas under the curve, we have to have it. But on your calculator, I'm, I'm going to give you a program that will actually draw those little rectangles for you. So it's really cool. Okay, so in y equals, I'm going to put in t squared. Well, I'm going to put in x squared because it's, they're dummy variables. Are you okay with that? And let's see, what, what are my inputs for my x's? Zero, the time goes from zero to what? Three. And on the y's, it starts at 0 and it goes up to 3 squared is 9. So this is what I did for my window. I went 0 to 3, scaled it by 1, but that's not important. And then I like to see my axis. So I put y min is negative 1, my max is 10. And then we're going to press graph. And there it is. Nothing spectacular. What's spectacular now is the symbol for finding the area under a curve is that integral symbol. It always gives you the total of whatever's under that curve. So I go second and I go to calculate and there's that little integral symbol. There's my delta x, there's my y value. I see, I literally see base times height there. And on the exam, they don't get picky if you forget the dx, so I don't want you to worry about it. However, you can't do some of the volume problems unless you figure out what that little differential is to begin with. So it actually has meaning. It is not just a symbol. It means the area under that curve. We're going to pick 7, and we want to start at 0, and we want to go to, i to press Enter, though, 3. You don't have to arrow. You can just type them in if you didn't know that. Just press the number. Yes, that will save you a lot of time. Also, before the exam, I'll show you some other calculator shortcuts. Is that more exact than our 8.5? That is exact. This is the exact answer. What did they, what did they do? Uh, just press enter. Now, you guys, we only did three rectangles, and we got 8.75, and the real area is 9. That's not bad. How would we get better? More rectangles. And you know what? How many rectangles do you want to put in there? An infinite number of rectangles because that's what, that, that's what your calculator is doing. It's not doing infinite, but it's, I don't know how many it's doing. Um, and the more you get in there and you take the limit, let n go to infinity, you get the area under the curve. It's calculus. That's what it's, uh, calculus is about, is limit. On the what? Oh, uh, I don't know if you'll get this picture on the Inspire. I was going to do an Inspire. Now, my programs, and I can give you the TNS files if you have an Inspire, uh, will let you draw the picture, and if you want to put four rectangles in at using the midpoint, it'll do that for you. So it's really nice to see, but I need your calculators. i gotta get, I got to find my programs and get them put on there. I shouldn't have a problem. I think I know there. And that's all there is to 5.1. Now, what you need to do for homework is, so if you look at this little yellow sheet, you can see you're just going to find the area of these rectangles. But be organized about it because you're looking for patterns. Now, we're not going to do the infinite ones. Just go like, because the algebra gets pretty ugly. Uh, we're not going to do those. So you're going to do the yellow sheet, which I already talked about, but I'll rewrite it. 1 through 6. And then in 5.1, the quick review, which should, isn't bad at all, shouldn't be, plus 1 through 3. 1 and 2 are just like the yellow sheet. 3 is more like this one. Now what we're going to do is we're going to work on the free response questions from the exam. We're doing great. Okay, we're going to, I want, I'm going to lead you through it. Not my 
not the best plan, but that's what we got. Oh, that's the second one. Okay. Oh, that's not the first one. Oh, no, wait. How many do I use? Did I screw up? There you go. Oh, there it is. Yep. Okay, so we're going to look at that, and we'll grade it. And I want you to realize it's not that bad. <laughs> now, this was uh, in the earlier days when the justifications weren't quite as rigid as they are now. Okay, so everybody got that? That's the first question, right? It wasn't the calculus so much that bothered you as it was the algebra. <laughs> you can come in and see your teacher on Thursday morning if you want to go over your exam with him or her. It says h is this function, and, the, and by the way, notice everything about here, such that h of 4 is equal to negative 3. So I have this ordered pair, 4 negative 3. They didn't give it to you for fun. They give it to you because you're going to need it. And the derivative of h is given by this. To find all values of x for which the graph has a horizontal tangent, determine whether or not you have a local max, min, or neither at each of the values. It's, you know, I, what I don't like about the question is you can find horizontal tangents, but we have to find all the critical points. All the critical points. And where are the critical points? Only if it's closed interval, and this is not. Okay? Those are the big things. The critical points are when the derivative is zero, where the derivative does not exist. So h prime is equal to x squared minus 2 divided by x. So how do I find where the derivative is zero? Where x squared minus 2 over x is what? Greater than, or actually I don't want greater than zero. What do I want? The horizontal tangents. But equals zero. So when is that zero? When the numerator is 0. So x squared minus 2 is equal to 0. You guys got that. Can't factor it. Not over the whole numbers or integers. So x squared is equal to 2. And then we're going to be picky about this. We're going to square root both sides. Because I'm not sure that we have this. The right-hand side is square root 2. Square roots must always be positive. What is the left-hand side? X represents anything. My students should know. What's the truth? What is this? Absolute value of X. You always have to use absolute value of X. And then we're going to solve the equation. And what does solve mean? I don't know. Cole, do you remember what solve means? Adam, do you? <laughs> what do you mean find the solution? What's special about the solution? Find the numbers that make the equation true. So I can put, do you guys, I can put square root of 2 into that absolute value. I can also put negative square root of 2. Well, many of you missed the negative answer. See what you're missing? But you were still out of luck for finding max and mins because you need all the critical points to do that. There is another critical point, and that's when h prime does not exist, and that occurs when x equals 0. If you don't have that, you can't find the max mins because you can't check your signs. So I'm going to put that on a number line. And here's 0. Here's square root of 2. Here's minus square root of 2. I like to label those. Now, this gets you no points, this number line. They changed the rules. In this particular year, you did get points, yes. That's correct. It's undefined. It's still a critical point. We don't know if it's in the domain or not. Does it say that? Yeah. yeah. That's okay. It's still a critical point. Any po when the slope is undefined, you could have a vertical tangent. You could have a sharp corner, but you could also have a discontinuity. So this is the discontinuity case. So it isn't connected at all. I forgot that it's, it's listed there. So there's another clue, a little bit of a clue there. But the more practice, the more you do with these, the more you'll see that. Okay, and then we test the regions, and some people had a hard time testing regions. Put in a big number, even like 10. 
10 squared minus 2 is positive over 10 is still a positive number. Right? Is that okay? What's the number between 0 and square root of 2 that would be easy to test? 1. 1 minus 2 is negative, and that's positive, so this is negative. Never make an assumption about the other side, because it's probably wrong 20% of the time. So if I try negative 1 here, that's still going to be positive. Take away 2, which is a negative. But that's also negative, so it's positive. And then, because we have if you look at the symmetry, you can probably guess it's negative, but let's put in ten, negative 10. That's still positive. That's negative, and so this is negative. Now I know what my function looks like. What does this first derivative being negative tell you? If the first derivative is negative, the function is going to what? Decrease. It decreases, zeroes out, and then, you're right, we have a discontinuity there. So it doesn't do anything. Could have been a vertical tangent if they hadn't said x is equal to zero. I don't know if, if that helps. It really doesn't matter in the rest of the problem. And then it decreases and then it increases. So we have a, we have minimum or max? Mims at x equals both plus or minus the square root of two. Now that is not sufficient. Why do we have minimums? Because what happens to h prime? But be succinct. It changes from minus to positive. Don't make big, long, drawn-out explanations because we might miss your point. <laughs> Keep it simple if you can. Does that make sense? Now we have four points. Because there it is. Plus or minus the analysis, which is the local mins. Now we might have tweaked it because we're grading more like the AP currently is now. You did lose a point for not dealing with the discontinuity, but it really, to say minus one, I, I don't even think you can do that. Be interesting, because I didn't grade that year. Be interesting to see if they would have at least given you this. But see, if you choose this number, I don't know. I think it's hard. If you don't have the zero there, I think it's almost impossible to get your four points, or even three. Okay, B, on what intervals is the graph concave up? Justify your answer. I justify my answer before I do it. Okay, Natalie, put your phone away, please. <laughs> Okay, how do you know it's concave up? Which derivative? The second derivative is what? Positive. That's concave up. There's my justification. So now what that tells me, I know what I need to do. If h prime is x squared minus 2 over x, I need to find h double prime. Some of you divided it out, some of you made it the product rule, and you can. It's honestly just easiest just to do it the way it is. So it's the denominator times the derivative of the numerator. What's the derivative of this? 2x, that's not hard. Minus the numerator. Do I need these parentheses? Yes. Times the derivative of the denominator. 1 all over x squared. And only way to figure out if that's positive, you have to simplify it. But here's what the problem was. You got a, I believe I, I don't remember how we graded it. You get a point for the de second derivative. This is 2x squared, and then it's going to be what? Minus x squared, and I would have to bet I saw at least 50% of these with the wrong sign, and I would have to guess that's true in the exam that year as well. Negative times a negative 2 is a positive 2. I saw a lot of minus 2s out there over x squared. Well, that's equal to x squared plus 2 over x squared. No matter what you put in for x, what will be true about the sign of this? It's positive for all x. So the answer is negative infinity to infinity. It is positive everywhere. And then you guys did really well on the next part, writing the equation of the tangent line. This makes sense? If you come and look at your exam, you're going to see you put a minus there. Just didn't distribute your minus. That's algebra. That's not the calculus. <laughs> I know you hate it when I say that. <laughs> Write the equation of the tangent line for h at x equals 4. We can do that right here. It's going to be y plus 3. See, I said that we'd have to know that. Equals my slope, x minus 4. What's my slope at x equals 4? 
Most of you got this right. 4 squared minus 2 over 4. You could write that for your answer. You can write 16 minus 2 is 14 over 4. Or you can do 7 halves. But if you can't reduce that correctly, you're better off leaving it 14 fourths. Because if you re reduce it wrong, they take the points off. That is only one point. Guess what? This is only one point as well. So on D, does the line tangent to the graph lie above or below the graph? Well, what does the function look like? It's concave up, right? I don't know where 4 is, but look at what's true about all your tangent lines. Are they above or below? Well, that won't be very good. <laughs> That's below. And you say because H is concave up. One point. That's all there is. Yeah. Now, when you look back at it, was it that bad? Yeah. Why? Tell me why, though. Well, that's okay. That, how, well, how do you know where to start? You read the question, and it says you want horizontal tangents, which then, ta then you're going to think on the exam. I'm sitting right next to you. And you go, I don't know where to start. And I'm going to say to you, read the question. It says horizontal tangents. What's true? You know what's true about a horizontal tangent. What's true about a horizontal tangent? What's true about the derivative? The derivative is zero. You get a point for saying that. You guys get that? You get a point for saying the derivative is zero. Go back and look over here. Not this year, but other years you got the point. More recently you get the point for saying that. They change the chief read reader out every three years, and the exam is written two years you know, ahead of time. So what we're looking at now is a chief reader who's actually not going to be the chief reader this year. But we're looking at what his philosophy and his beliefs were that the exam should reflect. So in this year, the chief reader didn't want to see that. They wanted to see this. But they took out the sign charts. That's not counting. It doesn't count today. So we have to really focus on the more recent exams. So that's all you can do is go by that. And then, of course, if you don't get the zero and you don't get the minus square root of two, you're really done on part A. That's the only thing I don't like about that problem. But finding the second derivative wasn't too bad. You get one point for that. You do get one point for saying the second derivative is positive because that's your justification, and then one point for your answer. Well, you really should say x not equal to 0 because it's not in the domain. I don't know how picky they'd be because I haven't graded one like that. Only, only one for your tangent line. But you might have been able to get three points here and one point right down here, even though you couldn't get A. So don't count yourself out, even though you might not get the first one. Always... Always keep trying. Some people only got that on the exam, but that's better than nothing. And you can go and look online on the analysis. It'll tell you how many people got these, you know, what the average score is. It's kind of interesting to see that. Oh, this is one of my favorite problems. Ah, I hate that when I do that. I guess I have to click on that. So give this one a try. I just want to slide it up. What's E? Well, e is a number. So is that 2.7 squared? I mean, what do I care? Okay. <laughs> write the equation of the tangent line. How do you write? Now, this is what I do in my class. I say, well, I don't know how to write that. No. How do you write the equation of a line? Start there. Y minus Y1 equals the slope X minus X1. Okay, that's where I start. So I want an equation of a line, and then I'll figure out what I need. I need X1, the slope, and Y1. They gave me X, didn't they? So it's not that bad. So this is equal to my slope. You know what? They gave me the slope too, didn't they? We should all know a derivative is nothing more than the slope which at f prime of e squared is equal to 1 minus the log of e squared over e squared squared. Do you need to simplify that? No. No need to simplify that. So my, But I'm going to because I can. This is 1 minus what? 2 log of e. Remember what the log of e is. Some of you didn't know that. It's 1. What's the log of 1? Zero. 
can't take logs of negative numbers. And that's over e to the fourth. So the slope ends up being negative one, right? Over e to the fourth. And then it's x minus the x value, which is e squared. Don't be afraid of e. <laughs> and it's y minus the y value. And you could have written it, the L natural log of E over E. You will get full credit. So let's say you're not sure what the natural log of E is. No, I'm using F of X here. So what's F of, oh, it's E squared, sorry. Yeah, so this would be log of E squared and that would be E squared. And you could simplify it or not, that's up to you. I wouldn't. Because <laughs> it, it just kills us to go and see this and then have you simplify it wrong because we have to take the point back. And we all are sitting there going, oh, don't do that. So don't simplify it. But we will because it might be a free uh, multiple choice question. What's the log of e squared? Two. So it's two over e squared equals negative one over e to the fourth x minus e squared. No. How many points was that? Do I have the points on here? There it is. Two. <laughs> one point for finding f of e squared, one point for finding f prime of e squared. So a lot of you got that, by the way. Okay, B. <laughs> Find the x coordinate of the critical point of my function. Now, where do critical points occur? Where f prime is zero or undefined, right? I'm going to keep that in my head. There are things you have to memorize. That's one of them. Determine whether it's a relative max, min. See, remember, this is the chapter 4 material. Or neither for the function. Justify your answer. So f prime is 1 minus log of x over x squared. There's one critical point that's really easy. Where is that? x equals what? 0. So let's not forget that when you can't can't divide by zero. That is a critical point. It's a boundary value that we're going to need. The other thing is, is where this derivative is equal to zero. And, if, you know, if you have problems with this, just the numerator is zero, but cross multiply, you'll still get one minus log of x equals zero. And you should be able to solve this. Right, Cole? What do I do to solve that? I'm going to pick on you because I know you, but <laughs> add log of x, right? How do you solve that? No, it's easier than that. It's e. Yeah, it's e to the first power equals x. Okay, not done. It says I want to know if we have a max, min, or neither. So I'm going to put my critical points here. Where is e, to the right or left of zero? <laughs> right. Okay, that was a zero. This is undefined. Why do I put those in there? Because I know if it's zero, it's smooth. Now, it still could be a horizontal tangent. It might not be a max min. This is either going to be a discontinuity. Is it a discontinuity? What was the original function? Oh, not only that, they say x is greater than zero. So we can't even include that, but it's a boundary. And all we have to do is worry about what happens between zero and e, and e, and infinity. Okay, I forgot where, what E is, so let's use 100. If I do 1 minus the log of 100 over 100 squared, is it positive or negative? Negative. Log of 100 is bigger than, than the 1. So this is negative, and I'll try 1. I think it's smaller than E, right? And what's the log of 1? 0. So 1 minus 0 over 1 squared is positive. So that means that my function is, and you, you get no points for this, but my function is increasing and then decreasing. So we have a max at x equals e because f prime goes from positive to negative. Is that okay? How many points is that? Three. Now we're at five out of nine. What what percent is five ninths? It's bigger than it's bigger than fifty. So now you're looking at a five on the exam. Can we do more? 
No, I'll, I'll be honest. This derivative is not nice. The second derivative is not nice. So let's graph the, uh, find the points of inflection. And actually, D, D you've got to be careful with. I didn't mark off, I don't know if the other teachers did, but I didn't mark off if you had the wrong sign on D. But, um, so you're better off just saying undefined rather than positive or negative infinity. Okay, so uh, where's my function? 1 minus log of x over x squared. So do this with me. I don't think so. Is it? I'll check. Well, I don't know if my clock is right. I would check my watch, but then I don't know what I can do with it. Oh, it's only 11. 11.05 is where we're out here. Yeah. I have all the neatest technology. I got the iPad. I have these inspired calculators. <laughs> hey, sit down, Adam. Nope. <laughs> okay, Adam, help me out with this. What is the second derivative? No, it's the denominator. Okay, guys, Shh. times the because the more we get done today, then the less homework you have tomorrow. Times the derivative of the numerator, which is zero. What's the derivative of log? It's on the wall. One over x. Okay, minus one minus the log of x times the derivative of x squared. Which is what? Okay, we better get that one right. So this is x to the fourth. Remember the homework is to, to work on that yellow sheet, 5, 1, the quick response and problems 1, 2, 3. Okay, let's simplify that. So that's x squared times a negative 1 over x. What's that going to give me? Negative x. Some of you lost your negative signs. Easy to do. Then it's minus. Here's, oh, we had a lot of problems. Let's just leave this. Let's do this first. So it's 2x minus 2x natural log of x over x to the fourth. Now let's simplify that. Because we had problems with the signs. Then this is minus 2x plus. 2x log of x over x to the fourth. And let's combine similar terms. This is not solving, this is simplifying. What's a minus x and a minus 2x? Minus 3x plus 2x log of x. And we should get this, that if I take one of the x's out of the numerator and one out of the denominator, factoring it, I'm not taking just one, x divides into the whole numerator, and I'm left with negative 3 plus 2 log of x. And if I divide x in the numer denominator, it's x cubed. It wasn't that bad, but it could easily make a mistake. So you get two points for f double prime. Um, it depends on where we're going to go. What are we trying to find when that's zero? If you don't, if you don't simplify, finding it the zero is going to be hard. So is this good enough? Now, I don't remember what year this was. Maybe, maybe not. But you want to set this equal to 0. And so where is this equal to 0? Negative 3 plus 2 log of x equals 0. So 2 log of x is equal to 3. Always isolate your log. So log of x is equal to 3 halves. This is the base. You go e to the 3 halves equals x. That's how you can undo it. I could show you another way, but we're kind of out of time today. I like hearing that. Yeah, it is. Oh. Yeah. Do your homework tonight. I'm going to check on it. You know I'm going to do that. First thing. <laughs> yes. It would be, but we're only asking where it's zero. Yes. Yes. No. You need to keep your keep your